right. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good to see y'all all in the house of the Lord this morning. I, I just walked to the door <clears throat> and looked outside, looked at all the vehicles that's sitting out there. And I thought to myself, you know, I have just thoughts that come up in my mind. I was looking at the vehicles sitting out there, and I said, you know, all these folks have uh, chosen to get up and, and come to a place of worship. And there's a reason why all those vehicles are sitting in the parking lot this morning. There's a reason that you're here where you are this morning. And it's because of your need and desire given by God to worship. Amen. Do you realize, church, that we were created and designed to worship? And you will either worship yourself and the things of the flesh, or you will worship God. And I just give God the praise this morning that we are here and able-bodied to come before Him and to worship the true living God. Amen? Amen. Praise God. I want to give God praise for each and every one of you, our brother there and the, the movement in his life of God and just thank him for his testimony and uh, just continue to pray for one another and uplift one another. Amen. All right, does anybody have any praise reports this morning? Anything you just want to give God praise for? Thank God for all the rain. Amen. Praise God. We've needed some rain, haven't we? Amen. Now we needed a cool 65 degrees every day, right in the middle of the day. Well, I, I was fit to see. I think the Lord said it needed to because it was, it was turning to close to Christ. We're going to love it very well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for air conditioning. It might have worked good. Yeah. Yeah. I want to praise God for allowing me and Tammy to travel over 4,000 miles in the last few weeks. Yeah, that is a well, you know, that's evidence of miracles still happening Amen. today. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, you know, thank, thank God that uh, y'all had safe travels, and we prayed for you. Yeah, you know, that is a miracle because I know Bryce, me, I don't know how many more we did. We traveled seven thousand miles a week. Amen. But it's a blessing God has took care of us. Amen. Amen. He has done a great work in my life, and I know a lot of y'all have life. We're here to praise Him and worship Him, and we're going to go to the text and and worship Him by the reading of His Word and understanding of His Word and His way and His will. Amen? Amen. All right. Does anybody have anything else on their heart they just want to bring up? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that we at the church is going to bless Elizabeth and Kinsley and Bryce and Madeline and Jackson the 24th, right after the church service. Well, I can just go ahead and tell you this. I have tried to do it every Sunday since they first talked about it. Because <laughs> my wife says every Sunday, it ain't this Sunday. It ain't this Sunday. And I'm like, look, we may just do it till it's time. <laughs> you know? We just need to pray that she doesn't have the baby till after the 24th. And she said, I'm careful about praying the whole goal now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's wait to the 24th. Look, this is the first time I, as a pastor, have, have been able to see a baby brought into the world in the church, and I'm ready to play with the young ones, so you don't get, you don't, oh, don't hold on to them. I'm ready to be able to play with them, too. <laughs> <laughs> don't hold on to them young ones long. I just thank the Lord for, for y'all being here and being under God's grace and His mercy and Look at all the men. Y'all got to come to this, this. Yes, it's a church wide thing, and I think the men yeah, are. The men ain't getting out of this. That's right. Like, me and Bryce got to be there at Red Yard. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to have finger foods that day, so if you want to eat, just come to eat. Yeah. Well, let me ask this is it, who's bringing fried chicken? The men stay in here, they've got to be fried chicken. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Long <laughs> long we eat. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. i got one thing I want to mention. Uh, um, Y'all are aware that my wife, uh, my daddy-in-law, uh, her daddy is, does have cancer, and, and uh, they've had some financial hardships uh, with uh, paying for treatments, one thing or another, and I just want to 
we, the church, helped them out with some of the bills and things that they needed. And uh, they sent us a card. And I, I like to read the card. It says, you're wonderful. I'm so thoughtful. I am so thankful, excuse me, for all the warmth, care, and love that God put into your heart. God has given me a great gift. We appreciate the gift and your thoughts, your thoughtfulness so much. Thanks for all the prayers we have left them and seen them working, or felt them. I can't read your mama right. I have them and seen them working. We love, we love you so much. Thankful and wonderful people. Love and prayers, Gary and Glenda Rowland. I'll make a note next time I read your mama's writing. <laughs> I have to practice it. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. That's what the church should be about. It should be about being there to edify and help one another. And the same goes for people of the church that when we come into hardship, we should be there for one another. We're not created to stand alone in this world. You think about this, when God made Adam, he said it is not good for man to be alone. What did he do? He sent water. He sent, it's not good. We're not created to do all this alone. Uh, the function of the church is to come up underneath each other, to edify and encourage and, and point each other to righteousness, to live righteously. And when we fail not to beat each other over the head and persecute one another but to stand each other up and point each other back to the cross and give them the truth of the word and remind of one another that God's grace is sufficient. Amen? Amen. Alright. Anybody have anything else this morning? If nobody has anything else, Shelby, would you come and take us off? Please, ma'am.
discussing the scriptures. We're going to be discussing the book of Genesis. We're going to be looking at, if you'll turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. I'm going to start reading at verse 1. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. I'll give you a little bit of a idea of what we're going to be discussing and how we're going to look at the scriptures and pull from the scriptures what God's intention for us to learn and hear from the word. We're going to be looking at sin and the fall and what life and death are according to God. When we were growing up, most of us, not all, but most of us growing up in the South, we, we grew up being taken to church or, or hearing uh, someone read the Bible. But most of us in our early age, very young, we read the first book of the Bible. What we normally read was the book of Genesis. The creation story. The book of Genesis is very uh, detailed in the creation of how God held his hand out and formed the earth, created man. But in chapter 3, God gives uh, an account of what life and death are. And where sin originates from. If you look with me in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. Follow as I read. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field. Which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman. As God indeed said. You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now what you have here is Adam and Eve in the garden. The garden is a place of life. It is a place where there is no sin, no suffering. All the things that are needed for Adam and Eve are in the garden, have been placed in the garden. They were given one rule in the garden, in a place where all of their needs were provided. They had need of nothing. They had food, shelter. All they had to do is but reach out and take hold of what God had provided in the garden. It was life in the presence of God. Can you imagine being in the garden, walking through the cool of the garden, not sweating, not growing tired, not growing hungry, not feeling sick, not having a headache, but just simply walking in God's perfect provision. 
Now we know from the scriptures that at this time, this must have been after the fall of Satan because Satan is on the earth. He is in the garden. Verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field. Now what is the serpent? It is Satan. What does God call Satan? Cunning. Most of you have had experiences with a lawyer. You would say most lawyers are cunning. They figure out what benefits them and their billfold and they tell you a lie so that their billfold gets thicker. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. Now we have the instance of God saying, this is what will happen. God is saying and has said, and God is perfection, and he has made a perfect place for Adam and Eve to dwell in paradise, in a place where there is no hurt or pain or suffering or death. And they were given one negative out of all the positives, do not eat of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So what does Satan tell the woman? What's the first thing Satan does? Can anybody tell me what Satan does there? Just plain old everyday English, what Satan just done? He lied. He told a downright lie. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. What did God say? You shall surely die. Satan absolutely opposes what God says and says, surely you will not die. How do we die? How did Adam and Eve, what was the death that could come from eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Basically, when she was to take from this tree and eat it. It's looking at God and saying, God, what you have provided in all the garden is not enough. I want more than you. There is sin. Therein lies idolatry. Therein lies creating yourself as God. What did Satan and what was Satan's goal? Is to cause God's creation, you and me, to want and desire more than God. To make and put our plate ourselves in the place of God. And what happened, if you listen right here, Look at verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, 
And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves for themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to me be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust. And all the days of your life I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And you think about we go through the New Testament. We I preach Jesus constantly for repentance, for salvation. I preach the gospel and I preach about Jesus. But you can go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible and right here you can see Jesus. How many of you see Jesus in this text? Let me help you if you can't see Jesus here. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Now you have her seed. Who is the seed of Eve? The lineage. If you <clears throat> follow the lineage down, who, who was born of Eve? Christ, Jesus. That is her seed. All the way through Abraham, all the way through. Jesus came about through Eve. Listen to what it says. And between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head. Jesus, what did he do on the cross? He defeated Satan. He dealt Satan a killer blow. It says in the scriptures, he will bruise your head. A bruise on your head is a show that it is fatal. That a bruise to the head or an impact to the head is fatal. And you shall bruise his heel. How many of you have ever bruised your heel and you walk with a limp? So what Christ, it, it's a picture and an image of Jesus Christ already in the book of Genesis. Right as they have fallen, God has already leaped into action to bring about salvation to his creation. God says, in between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. <laughs> To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. And in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground. 
For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. To no, to no good and evil, and now at least he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out, and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden. And a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Look at verse 22, church. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. To know good and evil. You see, before they, Adam and Eve took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they walked in the garden under the provision of God. Where there was dependence on God and God alone. He had given them every provision. They had need for nothing or no thing. But when Satan came in and, and it infiltrated doubt and told and utilized a lie, the woman looked and said, God, you're not enough. I want more. I want to decide what is good and what is evil. I want to be my own God. That's what the tree and taking from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil brought about. It brought about sin, the fall of mankind. Mankind saying that God, you are not enough. What do we see today in our society? God's perfect creation, male and female. God, God has made it perfectly according to God's foreknowledge and according to His glory and His plan and His purpose. But what we see today is people, his creation, continuing to rebel and say, God, you are not enough. I know greater than you. I choose what I think is right and what's wrong. I choose good and evil. I define what. I want it to be. I was looking at videos of, of people. If you, you look how Satan has worked in mankind and our culture today, and men and women. I'm not going to get into the LGBTQ thing and all this today, but I'm telling you, if you look at people and what they're doing, you have people out there today that are saying, well, you've got to use my preferred pronouns. How many of you have seen that? I know some of you have. Yeah. They want to be called not a he or a she, but a they or a them. All right? Just a, about a year ago, it started, I want to be called uh, gender neutral, or you call me they or them. And now it's went to what's called a neo-pronoun. They're not happy with that. So now it's a neo-pronoun where it, I'm an it or its. 
And it just gets more and more confusing. It gets so confusing that the very ones that's come up with this can't even separate. And I pulled up a video of watching one of these individuals try to explain. And this is what this person said. Today I'm a frog. And I'm a it with its bull ring in its nose and its hair green on this side, purple on this side. You see what it's done? And I'm not even, I, there's no way in the world I would ever pick at one of these people. I'm not here to pick on them. I'm here to point out how deceived they are. It is heart wrenching to me. It hurts my insides when I see a person that has so turned away from God that they are trying to define anything outside of what God said is right. God made male and female. And he made it in perfection. He made it right. And what Satan has continually done is try to get people to reject what is right. What did he do to Eve in the garden? He got her to reject what was right, what was true. What God gives in his sovereign power is right and true and holy and glory filled. But because of the fall, Sin came into the world. And outside of turning back to God, you will go away and you will define in your own mind and in your own heart what is right and what is wrong. Look at what's taking place in the earth and we ask, you know, what in the world's going on? What is happening to people? The same thing that's been happening since Genesis. Since the beginning. People reject God. And they say, God, you are not enough. God is enough. God is sufficient. He is all that I need and I want. But Satan has so deceived the world into following their own self and raising them all their own selves to be their own God. You all know what the, the commandments are. To not worship idols. Don't form any other gods, for I am the true God. I'm going to take you back to verse 22. Something that when I was young and growing up that I never really thought about. I never really sat down and understood it. But a lot of times the church misses this. Look at verse 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. Why did God refer to himself as us? Let y'all rumble that around in your head. This side, be quiet. <laughs> this side. Why did God refer to himself as us? Because there's three. Oh, I've heard all kinds of things. Oh, well, he just put the, the, the Jews, I mean, the, yeah, the Jews would say, oh, well, he's... Uh, Powerful, so he refers to himself as us. Like kings used to say, we will do this and we will do that. He's not referring to himself because of that. He's saying, man whom I'm formed in my image has become like one of us, knowing good from evil. He's referring to the Father, Son, 
and the Holy Spirit. I've heard people say, well, he's talking to the angels. The angels were not made in God's image. They are angels, servants of the Most High God. They are angels. He says the word and uses the word us because he is God, the three in one. A lot of people miss this. Also, you can back up in another place in Genesis, and he uses his, he refers to himself as us again. But in all this, what, what has taken place since the fall, God, what he done? He saw that man had fallen into sin. And man still remaining in the garden, he had access to who? He had access to God. In the scriptures, it's called the tree of life. Who gives eternal life, church? Jesus Christ. God is the one who gives eternal life. What did they, Adam and Eve, in the garden have possession of? Before they took of the fruit, they had eternal life. They did not die. They never got sick. They never got hot. They never got cold. They lived and walked with God. But now, because of the fall, God leaps into action. Look at what he does. He says, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. Now at least he put out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. God would not allow his creation, mankind, to live forever, to take hold of the tree of life in the garden and live forever in his sin. So in order that man would not continue or take hold of eternal life in his sin and die. You understand if you don't have eternal life, if you missed eternal life, if they were put out of the garden, that meant what? That what God said earlier in the text is true. Surely, if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. And in fact, when they were put out of the garden, they now no longer had eternal life because they were not with God any longer. So God sent them out of the garden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden. And a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Church, the actions of God here were so that mankind would not remain and live forever in his sin. Some of us today have chosen. We have a choice. Because of Christ Jesus coming and God sending his son to the cross, we today are given a choice to choose eternal life or to choose death. Some people that I, I sit with, for those of you that don't know, I'm a hospice chaplain. What I do weekly is sit with people as they are dying. I watch people. 
I watched their families. I, I, I went to the hospital. I got called in yesterday. I had to go to the hospital and sat with a family. As they sat around their mother that was taking her last breaths. And I talked to the son, which had been to prison. And I talked to the daughter, who had been divorced twice and had three or four children. All of which had lived hard lives and went through several things. And the son looked at me and said, I don't know how I'm going to go on without my mother. I lived with her. She took care of me. She never judged me. She always had the door open when I was in trouble. I always knew where I could go. I knew where I would be comforted. I knew where I would have strength given. And I can't go any further. I said, let me ask you, why did your mother, where did she get the ability to keep her door open for you. Where did she have the strength and the power to know that her son was in prison yet stay faithful and remain in this place to provide you with love and comfort and joy and peace? Where did that come from? He answered me, he said, God. I said, well, if you know the source of where that strength comes from. Why don't you go to the source? And he said, you're right. I understand what you're saying. I said, Jesus Christ is life. He is the one who provides us with eternal life and hope. I said, we're all sitting around here. You're all grieving uh, that your mother is, is about to pass away. But I'm telling you that what she has is eternal life. She does not die. And if you want eternal life, it is found in Christ Jesus under the provision of God for mankind from the fall to today. Jesus Christ has crushed the head of Satan and he has overcome death and the grave. But it is up to you whether you choose life or death. It is up to you. We're living in a world today where people have become reprobate. They're hateful, backbiting, thieving, adulterous, haters of God. And we have to live amongst people that are reprobate. They couldn't identify truth from a lie if you put it in front of them. Because they do not desire God. God is not enough for them. God's creation and His plan is not enough. So they go out and they seek to form their own belief. Thank God for his provision through Christ Jesus. What he has given us is eternal life and eternal hope. Do you realize that we have hope? And our hope is in Christ Jesus. We can walk into that physical bodily death and go in and smile. And say, God, I have come, I have been led to a place that you have brought me to. And I will glorify you in my physical death, for I know I have set up for me eternal life in the kingdom of God, where there is no more pain, there is no more suffering, there is no more hurt. There's nothing but your perfect provision, and it is Enough.
God has done all that we need. God has provided everything that we need in this world. He's given you the ability to come to Him by prayer when you are weak. He has given you food and nourishment. He says in Scripture, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I have promised you eternal life in Christ Jesus. How great that is. Can you wrap your head, church, around how great God is in His sovereign provision that you have a choice to choose eternal life in the presence of God or choose to reject Him and enter into death. Church, I know which one I'm going for. I live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He is my God, whom I worship, and He is enough. Now stand with me and let's go to the Lord and pray. I hope that when you would look at the book of Genesis, I know a lot of you you read Genesis when you were young and you don't see a need to read back through the book of Genesis. But I'm going to tell you, the Word of God is living. It is living. And it is able to encourage and strengthen God's people. Every word of it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father and our God, I just thank you for this great provision. God, that you have been so good to the church. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace and mercy that abounds in, in us, God. Oh, God, strengthen your church, Father. Give us the word. Give us ears to hear and, and able bodies to move and work, to go out of this place and tell people in the world about Jesus Christ, that they can choose eternal life in, in the provision of God. Or they can choose death. God, we choose eternal life in Jesus Christ. By the blood of the Lamb who has washed our sins away, we are righteous and holy and made new again in your eyes. And God, we long to be in your presence each and every day. We seek to know you better. Take hold of us each day, God. Make and mold us like clay in your hands till you come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Love y'all. Y'all have a wonderful week.